Matthew chapter uh, 5, and we're in our third week on the Sermon on the Mount, and, um, and as you go, you go through this, it's, uh, it's uh, very interesting. I want to warn you ahead of time that, uh, uh, that this is uh, really discouraging, by the way. I got a very, really discouraging message for you, and, uh, and uh, you're going to go through it going, ah, I, don't, I don't do that. Well, oh, that's just how I am, and Oh, man, I fall short in that area. And, but that's right. We're going to come back at the end and try to make it a little encouraging for you. So just kind of hang in there as we go through the Sermon on the Mount. I love people that say, oh, I love the Sermon on the Mount. You know, blessed are the peacekeepers. I love Sermon. You know, that's the person that's never read the Sermon on the Mount. I can tell you that right now. I don't like the Sermon on the Mount. It's just tough sledding, getting through this stuff. It's hard. As again, that's why people write books called The Hard Sayings of Jesus. It's this. It's the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and we start out with that Beatitudes, again, that Latin word for blessed is. And, uh, and we learn that uh, we're to be broken and sorrowful over our own sin. And, we're, and that's a blessing if, if we're like that. You know, and that God wants to make us peace uh, uh, makers and, uh, and so forth. And, uh, and then we moved into the, uh, the message uh, uh, last week about uh, being the, the salt, you know, of the world and a light like a city set on a hill and so forth. And then Jesus uh, then moves into six illustrations. And again, his point is, uh, is this. He has, uh, you know, uh, called his disciples. Uh, he's seen the crowd and taken them, his disciples, up on a hill. And then he sets down. And then he begins to teach them these things. And, uh, and he teaches them these things because their understanding uh, of the Bible is not correct. Because their Bible teachers were the Pharisees and, and the scribes. Uh, and their view of the scriptures and what God wanted was to simply be a religious person, to have something outward. And Jesus is trying to make the point, and he says in Matthew 5.20, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That might have been a little bit of a problem since in their Judaism at that point, there was an idiom, as I mentioned last week, that said, if only two people went to heaven, it would be a Pharisee and a scribe. <laughs> if they're not getting in, who's getting in? But Jesus' whole point is that they took the law and tried to use that as a, as a means for righteousness, and it was never intended that. If you eat at McDonald's on a regular basis, three meals a day for a while, don't tell me you're doing that for nutritional purposes. Those places were never established for that reason. They were established to offer you cheap, fast, filling food. So if you're hungry, you got a couple of bucks, run through the drive-thru. It'll, it'll get you to dinner. Uh, again, their purpose was never, you know, they don't serve smoothies on the side. You can't go into McDonald's and, and buy your uh, supplements and uh, nutritional items and everything. I mean, they're working at it. You know, they do the salads and all that stuff now. They've taken so much heat for it. But that wasn't the intent. Their intent was just, hey, fast food, clean place, uh, efficient, you know, filling. That was it. But So you don't want to take that and try to make it something that's not. That's what the Pharisee had done. They had taken the law of God, which is perfect, reviving the soul. The statues of the Lord's are, are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The problem isn't the word of God, the law, the Old Testament. The problem was it was never meant to make us righteous. We're only righteous in, in Jesus Christ. So that's, that's the background. And so Jesus now begins to illustrate that uh, with... Uh, with uh, six different things. Uh, the first one, he says uh, that I've kind of uh, uh, kind of outlined things this way. Jesus gives a higher standard for a particular emotion, uh, and Jesus will uh, uh, have a pattern. Will he'll say, "This is what 
the Pharisees say and what they teach, but this is really the intent or the heart of God in this matter. Uh, let's look at the first one, verse 21. You've heard it said uh, to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says his, to his brother, Raka is answerable to the Sanhedrin, but anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Second illustration, uh, to back that up, settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while uh, you are still with him on the way or he may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Again, pattern's the same. Uh, the first aspect of this, Jesus states that their teaching of the law says, do not murder. And again, that's based on the sixth commandment. Now, <laughs> nobody carried around, you know, a little New Testament, you know, pocket pulled out. You know, these guys didn't have Bibles. Uh, they did the best and memorized a lot, quite a bit of scriptures. And certainly the Pharisees and the scribes had major portions, if not all of the Old Testament memorized at, at points in time. But the common people, these guys that are his disciples, these fishermen and so forth, uh, limited knowledge. What they knew about the Bible is what they'd been taught. And what they'd been taught was from the Pharisees and their view. And he's saying, you've heard them teach this long ago. The Pharisees, their view of this, do not murder. Uh, he says there's a lot more to do with it, uh, this whole issue than that. Because God is concerned about our hearts. Uh, later in Matthew, Matthew 15, 18... Jesus will say, but the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart. And these make a man unclean. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. This, uh, these are what make a man unclean. It's not what he's saying because, again, it's, it's uh, from the heart the mouth speaks, as, uh, as another translation says. First uh, Samuel 16, 7, the Lord does not look on, uh, on things as man looks, Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the, the heart. We all know that. But, I mean, these, that's, and that's what he's trying to teach here. So that's good to, to keep in mind. Now, again, every time he lays out, this is what they say, then he says, but, which is always a contrast. In contrast to what they're saying, uh, again, this is God's uh, intent. Uh, they are saying that, uh, that do not murder or you'll be subject to uh, to uh, judgment. That's not what the law said. What, what, did the, what does Leviticus say if you kill somebody? What's going to happen to you? That's your, you're going to die, right? That's what it actually said. See, that's not what they're teaching anymore. They're now teaching, if you commit murder, just get a good attorney. You understand? You, you're going to be subject to judgment. That's what they were teaching. That's not what the Bible said. It said if you, if you kill somebody, you're going to die. Capital punishment. There wasn't no ifs, ands, and buts about it. In fact, if you couldn't get to a city of refuge, one of his relatives could kill you on the way if he could catch you. <laughs> right? Things changed a little bit here in their interpretation of what God said. Now, Jesus takes that and not just corrects their biblical thinking and what the Bible says. He goes way beyond that and goes to the intent of the heart. So the second half of this, which will be the pattern, 1B is uh, Jesus contrasts their teaching uh, to God's standard and gives the moral intent behind the law. They say, do not murder. He says, uh, do not be angry because uh, it's anger that leads uh, to, to murder. Uh, just to encourage you a little bit, I'm going to really camp out on the first three, so don't panic. We'll, we'll try to move a little quicker through the last three. Wow, six-point sermon. We're going to be here a while. Uh, and I know there's only a few of us that deal with the anger, so the rest of you that really got this under control, just kind of bear with us a little bit here. <laughs> anger. Uh, Jesus is very uh, concerned about it. A <coughs> couple of things. Uh, it's anger without cause. Isn't, Jesus isn't saying when the guy clobbers you over the head, don't get angry. This is anger without cause. It's just anger. 
People have that? Yeah, people have that. They're just, they walk around angry, and it doesn't take much to, to set them off. And Jesus says that God is very concerned about our heart condition and when we just carry anger around uh, with us. And there's a progression that he lays out here that's, I think, uh, very interesting. Uh, and the first one is that uh, uh, anyone who says uh, Raka will be, uh, you know, in, in be judged by the Sanhedrin. What, what does that mean? That means you're an idiot. Yeah, I kind of like that term. Nobody even know what I'm talking about. You know, no, don't. It's not biblical to call people that. He's just using an illustration here. Raka. So there's, I can have an anger in my heart that uh, basically leads me to actually making a false accusation against somebody. It doesn't say anywhere that this person is, is an idiot at all. He may be a, a person of tremendous integrity. Anger in my heart can lead me to say things I shouldn't be saying. Anybody relate to that? Things that are not true. And I don't even know why I'm angry. I'm just angry. So I'm just going to say something. Uh, yeah, but I didn't kill anybody. <laughs> that's not the point. I mean, that, that, that happens. You know, it's not like the guy that's super calm and collective that, that murders somebody. You know, it's, this is a progression. But it begins with anger for, for uh, no reason. Or you, you don't even know why you're anger, angry. And then it leads to a false accusation. And then he gives a second illustration. He says, but anyone who says you're a fool will be in danger of the fires of hell. And, um, and, and if you read the, 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 writing, the, the teachings of Jesus, for some reason, he really, he mentions this thing of hell a lot. I think it's because it's really there. It's really going to happen. And there should be a real concern about that. That's kind of a, a side issue. But we'll just see it over and over again as we go through this gospel and listen to what Jesus says. But again, you fool. Well, what's that all about? Well, he's slandering the person's character now. I get anger in my heart, and what I say really attacks who they are and, and, their, and their, their character. And, and when that's happening, Jesus is saying, look what's in your heart. Look what's going on. Uh, he gives a solution. Verse 23, because of this happening, the therefore, because this is happening, therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar first, we might say first and foremost, go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. If you're coming to worship the Lord, if you think you can have a relationship with the Lord, walking around angry, slandering other people, saying things about them, Jesus, stop right there. <laughs> he says, don't even come to church. Go to the person and say, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, you know, you're an idiot and I told people you were. You know, that's not, you know, the idea. It's just, you go and, and be reconciled. How do you be reconciled? Uh, well, if that guy would get it together. No. <laughs> you, you have to humble yourself. What if they said this in return? It doesn't matter. You want to have a relationship with God? Lose the anger. How do you do that? By being reconciled to your brother. A lot of angry people around. I um, had uh, uh, mentioned it before, but I, uh, you know, for <laughs> four or five years, I, you know, I, I taught uh, baseball with uh, younger kids and stuff. And, and most of my kids were from Waimanalo. And, and um, I never met a bunch of angry or young kids in my life. And, uh, and typically, I had about 15 and, uh, and with the exception of Josh and Micah, we were joking about that, Micah uh, was uh, on the team one year. And uh, typically there would be like two kids, three tops that had a mom and dad at home. All the others, 13, sometimes as many as 14. Either a single mom doing her best to raise them or no parents. They're being raised by their, uh, their grandparents. I remember uh, two kids in particular, twins cute little guys being raised by their uh, grandparents because both parents were killed in a drug-related car accident. So angry kids. They're ticked. They don't even know why. I, I knew why. They didn't know why. They're just mad all the time. And, and they, they showed it by what came out of their mouth to other players and to me. And, and uh, it, was, it was an interesting uh, arena to be in and trying to minister to these kids. It was difficult. And I, I don't say that she could say, well, I hope God takes care of those kids, you know, because I'm glad I don't have that problem. 
That's not the idea. When there's stuff coming out of our mouths that shouldn't be coming out of our mouths as believers, then uh, we need to realize that the issue is my heart, my own anger, and Jesus says, be reconciled. Do something about it. Well, Lord, I think I'll just talk to you about it and worship you. No, he says, stop right there and go and deal with it. He says, uh, otherwise, here's what's going to happen. Your anger is going to lead you to just, uh, your judgment gets all out of whack about people. He says, and he gives this illustration. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just relate to this too much. Uh, uh, he says, you could actually end up taking someone to court and you're the one that's guilty. He said, you better try to get reconciled with this guy on the way. Because when you get there, you might find out that you're the one that's guilty and you're the one that goes to jail and not even him. Because your anger so distorts things. Several years ago, I, I, um, I got a call and uh, uh, was asked by an attorney to actually sit on a, on a panel with uh, uh, another pastor and another brother I knew well that uh, runs a missions organization and stuff. And, and there were two uh, believers that, uh, and one had a lawsuit against the other one. And they had been, you know, uh, these things take time and had been going through uh, uh, the court system. And then, and then prior to actually going to trial, the, the judge uh, from the state of Hawaii said, I think you should at least try arbitration. And they, as, uh, they were both Christians. And so uh, they said, uh, okay, well, uh, who should be on this panel? And they said, well, that's up to you. And so they said, okay, I'll pick one guy. He says, I'll pick one guy, and then we'll have to agree on the third. So one guy picked me. Uh, it was actually a, a gal. Uh, the guy picked uh, another Calvary Chapel pastor. And then... And then uh, the other brother that was there with us. And so we agreed to kind of arbitrate this thing. And then I get in the mail, a legal brief that thick. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, it's going to be a little more difficult than I thought. But the court had basically said, whatever our ruling is, that's it. It's like they give us the power of, of the judge to do that. And um, uh, <clears throat> the other guy that was with us was Danny Lehman. And, and Danny said, you know, when we do this, man, we better pray that the fear of God is over us because what we decide is legal and binding. And there was a lot of money at stake. It was a business thing. And uh, we went through this. Uh, I read the brief and um, we sat down for like two days of testimony and so forth. And uh, by, by the end of the first day, the guy that brought the lawsuit, I was ready to kill him. Because he was rocking. He was such an idiot for doing this. Here, this godly woman who uh, owned and operated this business had reached out and helped him and done these things. And this, this lawsuit was so frivolous, I couldn't believe it. Uh, and in the end, we, we, when we gave our little judgment, we railed on the attorneys for even letting it go this far. They should have moved for a summary judgment. This, I think they were just milking them both. You know, it was ridiculous. Uh, and, and, but of course my anger was a righteous indignation I just want you to know that <laughs> but I, it, it's like that's exactly what, uh, what happened here and um, I, I just thought that the only thing that has kept this guy alive was the fact that her husband was a marine colonel and had a lot of discipline otherwise he would have beat that guy to death for some of the slanderous thing he said about his wife that's the only thing I could figure and I commended him for it I don't know that I could have done that uh, it was terrible what drove this guy? anger he didn't get his way he was so angry that he sues her. The judgment goes against him and he's the one that has to pay all of the bills. Jesus says that's what anger does and eventually it can lead to murder. But we have a tendency to think, like the Pharisees, well, as long as I don't commit murder, <laughs> and even if I do, if I get a good attorney, I'm still okay. According to the law, or their teaching of the law, and Jesus says, man, it's, it's so much more than that. Jesus gives a higher standard for a particular emotion and one that affects all of us, that of anger. Secondly, he gives us a higher standard for purity in relationships. And we see that in verses 27 to 30. You've heard, it, uh, heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. 
It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. There's that hell thing again. And if your right hand causes you to, to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. So again, the pattern is the same. Jesus states that their teaching of the law says, do not, do not commit adultery. And then he gives the but. He begins to contrast that with uh, God's standard. A couple of things need to be said. And one is that the society they lived in, the Roman society was absolutely immoral. It was so immoral, they were worse than us. <laughs> That's pretty bad. But we're going that way. Even secular writers have said the Roman Empire crumbled from within because of immorality. That's what the non-Christian guys say. Uh, and, uh, and, and these are the times of, of this writing. Uh, the standard do not commit adultery is the seventh commandment. But God's standard was do not lust in your heart. And, uh, and Jesus says here it's a pattern of sin. Uh, the word look is in the present tense. That means it's continuous. He's talking about a guy in this case that is continually looking. And notice that it's a woman. It's not women. It's a particular woman. And he's continually looking at her and lusting in his heart over this particular woman. And Jesus says, it's the same as if you've committed adultery. Well, might as well do it. Then. No, that's not what he's saying. It's not the same ramifications. He's just saying, examine your heart. That's the way God views the thing. I, um, when we were, uh, I was first in college and, uh, uh, you know, as we say, young and dumb and I was about 18. We, uh, you know, uh, we're there, you know, in college, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, we're checking out all the girls and stuff. And um, that doesn't happen anymore, but it used to <laughs> back ways. And uh, mo this is really only an issue for guys at about 22 and younger. So, amen, guys. So I just thought I'd clarify that a little bit and verify you to the fact that the Bible does say all men are liars. So uh, I just always like to prove the Bible to be true. And, uh, but anyway, we we're hanging out. But one of the guys, he found a girlfriend real quick and stuff. And so uh, as we were doing our thing and then, uh, and then we would notice him uh, noticing young ladies walking by and he, he would, we'd say, hey, you've already got a girlfriend. He says, oh, just because you're on a diet doesn't mean you can't look at the menu. Yeah, you're not going to stay on the diet, though. I mean, that's the, that's the whole point. But this is the, the thinking here of this idea that as long as I don't actually engage in the physical act, then I'm still okay. And God says, no, it isn't. Uh, it, it's not at all. He says, hey, bring your thoughts captive. Renew your mind. Walk in the spirit. Don't gratify the sinful uh, nature. Uh, again, we're not talking about simply admiring somebody of the opposite sex. And we're not simply ad talking about uh, seeing uh, a beautiful gal walk by and go, wow, good job, God. You know, and just keep them going. There's, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. We're talking about, a, again, a present tense continual look at a particular person in person or on a computer screen or on a magazine for the purpose of lusting in your heart. And, um, and then what happens is uh, that leads to a, a really a sexual immorality in your own mind and your own thinking. Is this really a, a big concern? Notice the illustrations that Jesus gives. Uh, again, he's using a typical rabbinical Hebrew terminology of hyperbole, uh, of exaggeration to try to make a point. If you're doing this, simply gouge your eye out, throw it away. Better that than to burn in hell. Better just to chop off a hand, throw it away, than to burn in hell. There was an early church father. I meant to look it up but uh, between services, but I didn't. But <clears throat> one of the early church fathers, if I said his name, you'd recognize it. He did this. He, he was struggling with this issue, and he popped his eyeball out. That's not what Jesus is talking about. It's, uh, he's, he's exaggerating so we get it. It means this is like really a big issue, uh, a severe issue. And, uh, and we need to be aware of it. Better to lose a body part than be thrown into the fires of hell. What's the other implication here? Are believers thrown into the fires of hell? I don't think so. So the person who is the continual look at someone else continually, and it just goes on and on, apparently is not a believer. Following that? Believers don't do this. Believers may go down this road. It's a big problem with guys. It's the biggest problem, apparently, statistically, pornography with Christian guys is it is with the general population, according to some surveys. And uh, it's just too easy because of, of the internet and so forth. 
And uh, the whole problem is there should be some conviction uh, in your own heart of what's going on. Uh, God's not going to let you get away with it for very long. He'll bring the conviction and try to bring you back. And if he has to, he'll take you to the woodshed and beat you over the head a little bit circumstantially, get you to your knees and draw you back to yourself. But the unbeliever, man, he's just on his own. And a lot of, and this is just the, it is the prevailing attitude, is the prevailing thought of guys in our culture. And there's just not much of an influence out of it. In fact, there's just the media and everything else just stokes the fires continually. And it's okay. And it's okay. It's amazing. There's wives just saying, well, that's just the way my husband is. That's ridiculous. It's not just, yeah, well, yeah, he's a, he's a lousy sinner that is committing adultery on a regular basis. I think that should concern you a little bit if you're a wife. A little bit. Uh, again, yeah, but he's never out, gone out and done it. Jesus says that's not the issue. The issue is the heart. Anger can lead to murder. Uh, you know, this kind of lustful thinking can uh, lead you down a road to cause all kind of destruction. And it already is, even if you go there. And so Jesus says, hey, there's a higher standard for purity in our relationships. Thirdly, Jesus gives us a higher standard for permanence in marriage. And we see this in verse 31 and 32. It's been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries Anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. I just want to say, this is probably one of the most misunderstood passages of Scripture in the Bible. It's caused more destruction in people's lives than I can even, I can even think of. Uh, if, if you kind of have a preconceived notion of what the Bible says about this passage, can you just kind of uh, be an, an agnostic for a moment, which means you don't have an opinion, you're just not sure, and just kind of bear with me for a moment. Let me uh, state a few things. Pattern is the same. Jesus states their teaching of the law, the Pharisees' teaching of the law says, do not divorce without a written consent. Uh, consent. And that was based on Deuteronomy 24 uh, and other passages. And, and what that passage says is that if you find some uncleanness in her, you can divorce her. And the way you do it is by writing a certificate of divorce. I divorce her. I found uncleanness in her. You go to the city elder... That's it. Jesus says, you know, God allowed Moses to institute this and put it in the law because of the hardness of your own hearts. The problem is defining the word uncleanness. Now, if you're not sure what they thought of that, and we will get to this again in Matthew 19. In Matthew 19, 3, it says, some Pharisees came to him, to Jesus, to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any in every reason. What could a man divorce his wife for? Any and every reason. Why? Because the law said he could do it. The law said he could divorce her for any and every reason because of the word uncleanness. What does that mean? We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. It's only used one other time in the Bible. And that's when they were kind of in the tabernacle days and they're kind of camping out and it says when you... Uh, Kind of use the bathroom outside the camp. Make sure to take the shovel with you. That's the only other time the word uncleanness is used. Well, what does it mean? I don't know. So they said, I know what it means. You can divorce her for any and every reason. And Jesus says, yeah, you know, I understand your thinking, but that's not the intent of God's heart. Uh, you're, you're missing it here. Uh, that's, does, does this sound familiar? Is this the days that we live in? People divorce for any and every reason? I, uh, I had a, a gal one time admit to me after the demise of, of their marriage that she totally regretted divorcing her husband. And the reason she did that because she was so angry all the time with him because he didn't rinse his dishes at the sink. It, it happens. See, because they just get ticked and then it's something else and then it's something else and then it's saying things and then things are said back and it just, it just, it just goes and then they build walls and, and nobody forgives and he doesn't understand and you know and in the final analysis she says I think that's where it all started 
any and every reason. It, it's, it's, it's just where we live. I mean, it's our, our fallen nature. It's a whole society that kind of uh, drives us this way. And um, uh, what Jesus is concerned about was the, the reason for the divorce. Is divorce a sin? No. Is it ever mentioned as a sin in the Bible? Never. Are we all on the same page? It, it's not a sin. It's never mentioned as a sin in the Bible. Jesus is concerned about the reason what's in our hearts. Let me, let me illustrate how, how badly we've gotten this. I don't know about other places, but certainly within American Christianity. <clears throat> There's, uh, I, I have been married and divorced twice before I came to faith in Christ. I'm not, I'm, just, I'm not bragging about that. I'm just telling you that's kind of part of what my life was about for any and every reason. And uh, because of that, because of that, um, some of the guys that I really admire in the ministry, buy their commentaries, read them, listen to them when I can. I think they're great preachers. They would never let me in their pulpits. They would never let me be a member of their church. They would never let me teach the, a Sunday school class because I've been divorced, even though it was before I became a Christian. Now, if I killed somebody, if I had been a heroin addict, gone to jail for it, sold drugs, whatever it is, and then, you know, found Christ in prison, come out of prison, and was restored and, you know, went to Bible college, they would welcome me. They'd ordain me and put in their pulpits. Okay, to kill somebody, just don't get divorced. Do we find a, do you have a problem with that? I, that, that seems weird to me. You see what I mean? Especially when, <laughs> the, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be forgiven and those guys shouldn't be, you know, uh, God using them. And obviously God, you know, that's, we just described half the pastors in Calvary Chapel there, you know, with one of those things that mentioned, you know, we, we kind of cover all of those uh, ugly sins in the Bible, you know, it's on the resumes. But uh, God, God can use you and restore you and so forth. But we've really missed this whole issue of divorce. Jesus is very concerned about why. So he says, here's an, uh, an illustration. Uh, and uh, I, I guess just because he picked on the guys, now he's going to pick on the gals. If a, if a woman commits adultery uh, and then uh, and divorces her husband and gets married again, she's committing adultery. And if she gets divorced again, she's committing adultery. It doesn't matter if you've got a another uh, uh, marriage license and you stood before someone at some point in time, you keep committing and you're causing them to commit adultery. Why? She never repented. She never repented. She committed adultery. That's all right, I'll do it again. That's all right, I'll do it again. That's all right, I'll do it again. Does that happen today? Uh, I, I have to show you the source of these statistics. It's from <coughs> David Hawking and, and from Orange County, but I just thought they were, were, were interesting, this whole area of, of divorce. What if I just say um, for uh, uh, everybody that gets married in this country, how many, how many get divorced? Half? We'd all say half? Is that, is that the general prevailing thought? That, that's not true. That's not true. What happens is there's a subculture of people that get married and divorced and married and divorced and married and divorced and married and divorced. At the Hall of Records, they know him by name seven, eight times. That throws off the curve just a little bit. When you count how many marriages and you count how many divorces, that kind of wrecks the curve because of the subculture of people that get divorced for any and every reason. Why is that popularized? So that we'll believe, oh yeah, everybody does it. Happens all the time. It doesn't happen as much as we think it does. I just thought that was very interesting. It doesn't happen as much as we think it does. But there's, there's a media and a world system against God's standards that would like us, even as Christians, to think that it, that it does. <clears throat> if you marry and divorce, the chances of you marrying and divorce again climb dramatically. Because as Jesus said, you're just committing adultery again. Because you've never dealt with the hard issue. Jesus is not concerned about divorce. Divorce is not sin. He's saying, Why? Why'd you get a divorce? What happened? Deal with it. Repent if you need to repent. Make it right before God. And then, hey, go on, go on with the Lord. 
Glorious, great. God can heal. Divorce is not the impardonable sin. Do we, do we understand this? People feel so, so condemned over, over this issue. And I don't even want to do a show of hands of how many people have been divorced at some point in time here. But uh, I'm just saying there's probably more than me that are here, you know. And we have such a skewed view of what Jesus says. Jesus is concerned about what's in our heart. That's the theme, right? This is the context. This is not everything the Bible says about divorce. Divorce give other reasons. Paul uh, goes on and gives other reasons for divorce. Uh, th that's not the issue here. The issue, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount where he's saying that God is very concerned about our hearts and why we do what we do and what motivates us. And we don't think that somehow we can keep an outward code and that's going to make us righteous. No, it won't. He goes, I got something a lot better than that for you. That's religion. I got something way better than that in mind for you guys. Now, can you imagine Peter and the guy sitting there, they're just going, mouths drop, going like, we're toast, man. <laughs> we're never going to be able to live up to this. That's okay. He's going to top it off by saying, be perfect. Right? That's, what, that's, the, that's the bottom line to this. So if you're, if you're still hanging in there, you're, you're going to get wiped out before we get to the end. I'm just, I'm just telling you that before we get there. But it's a big issue uh, in our, our own culture. Now, I, I got another statistic, just last one, and we'll move on. I thought it was, uh, was interesting that when, when, uh, when people get divorced as, as uh, non-Christians, and then, and, then, and then they find Christ, these two people, people that are divorced find Christ uh, before their next marriage or in the midst of their marriage, their chances of the divorce are minimal. It goes down just absolutely dr dramatically because God can come in and heal when we deal with the issue of why. Why? Why did it happen? And, uh, you know, there's, there's two sides to the story. So, hey, God's concerned about our heart. Get your heart right with the Lord and then go on with the Lord. Uh, that's, uh, that's the message here. But we're not going to be able to do it on our own, as we'll see. We really need the Lord. Four, Jesus gives us a higher standard for personal integrity. Verse 33 to 37. Again, you've heard it said uh, to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. Uh, but I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot even make one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes, and your no be no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. So Jesus again states in their teaching, they said simply don't break an oath, which is the third commandment. Don't take the Lord's name in vain because they would say, <laughs> they would say, oh, I swear by the city of Jerusalem. Oh, I swear by the God that's in heaven and so forth. Because other than that, they're going to lie to you. <laughs> it's like why, when you go to court, when they put your hand on the Bible and go, I you know, make you swear an oath. Why? Because they're figuring you're going to lie otherwise. And they're, they're trying to pin you down a little bit here. And that, that was the, the Pharisees way. And Jesus says, just don't lie. <laughs> you know, Jesus said, no lie, brah. Did, did you get that in there? I think it's in there somewhere in a parenthesis. Just let your yes be yes, your no be no, and stop taking the Lord's name in vain, is what he's saying, and breaking that commandment. He says, just tell the truth. Five, Jesus gives us a higher standard for our attitude towards possessions. Verse 38, you're really not going to like this one. I mean, I, I don't like it, but maybe you're not going to like it either. You've heard it uh, that it was said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. See, that kind of rubs me the wrong way. Just, I just throw that in as a personal comment. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other cheek. And if someone wants to sue you, but get the best attorney you can get. Uh oh, and then take your tunic. Let him have your cloak as well. You see why this is kind of tough here? If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Uh, to me, this is like just the, the, the most difficult thing. Maybe that's why he kind of is saving it. Of course, it, you know, he keeps up in the ante as we go, we go through this. Uh, same pattern. Jesus states they're teaching the law says an eye for an eye and a tooth for truth. Uh, tooth for tooth coming out of Deuteronomy, what we call the law of, uh, of retribution. And, um, and again, that was uh, to keep people from seeking more damages than they should deserve. 
uh, let the punishment fit the crime, you know, basically. Don't go beyond that kind of in your judgments and everything. This was the, the idea of an eye for an eye, a tooth for tooth. People think that's harsh. That's mercy. That's mercy so that they would not go beyond that law of retribution. Again, the contrast, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. So uh, they had a standard, but God's standard was be merciful even to an, uh, an evil person. If someone, uh, again, in his illustrations then hits you on one cheek, uh, then turn the other cheek. In other words, don't retaliate. And, uh, and again, we're talking about uh, individual concept here. Nationally, uh, you know, we, uh, God in Romans 13 gives authority to the state. He gives them the sword and says, defend this civilian population, you know, go to war, you know, if you have to, to get rid of the evil guys and so on and so forth. We had a great lesson on that a few weeks ago uh, in the Truth uh, Project. And, uh, and so guys, guys that put on a military uniform or a police uniform and they swear an oath, they are carrying out God's command. So I understand why Christians would want to be in the military and act on God's behalf. I just praise God there's non-Christians that want to do that as well. But Christians are given that authority from God to represent their government and protect us from evil. But this is talking about individually. Individually, somebody punches you. Oh, bro, I got two cousins. You should see how big they are. We're going after this guy. No, that's, that's not what that happens, right? And it all escalates and everything. Unless you, if you grew up in Hawaii, it, it escalates. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just telling you. And Jesus says, don't do that. Don't retaliate. Uh, and then he says, uh, if someone, uh, uh, you know, takes your tunic, sues you for your tunic, then give them the cloak uh, as well. And I just tell you, this is very, this is very difficult stuff. Resist, don't resist an evil person. Are you kidding I want to kill him. What do you mean? Don't resist him. Uh, that's what I want to do. Everything in my flesh says resist the evil person. And, and I'm thankful that, uh, again, God instituted authorities over us to protect us from, uh, from evil people. Uh, but at the same time, individually, just says, don't do it. I'll take care of the situation. Uh, let, me, let me mention a couple things. I'll come back to what I think is the overriding principle here. If someone forces you to walk a mile, then, then go the next. Under Roman law, a Roman soldier at any point in time could say, hey, you, pick that up, and you had to carry it a mile. By Roman law, no squabbling, probably threw in a few adjectives as he got your attention. And uh, you carried a mile. Jesus says, when you get to the end of the mile, say, I'll carry another mile for you. Why? You're not required to do that. Oh, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. He said to carry an extra mile. Why? You understand that if we, if we kind of live this stuff out, people would be going, wow, what's up with you? You're not like other people because you're not so hung up about your possessions. Isn't that the, the overriding thing? Why am I worried about somebody suing me? I don't want to lose any of my possessions. You know, the, the things in this, my, you know, my toys mean a lot to me, you know, kind of a thing. Even though I know they're all going to burn, we're going to be with the Lord forever, you know. But I must be a good steward, you know. That's what I say. <laughs> uh, but Jesus says, uh, think it through a little bit. Is God in the midst of this? Is God doing something? What would the Lord have you to do? You know what? I don't care what you're doing. I just want to know why you're doing it. What, what's really in your heart? Is there some anger there and you don't even know why? Are you worried about your rights? You're my child. I'm going to watch out over you. It's really an issue of big time faith, isn't it? I mean, that God, and God sometimes God takes these situations and he just kind of presses us a little and says, still with me here? Still trusting me? Oh, good. Let's go on a little while. And then he comes back later and puts us in the olive press again. And uh, I think he's trying to squeeze all the junk out of us so he can uh, use us. Someone asks you for your help, don't refuse. Uh, ask for a loan, then, then loan. Uh, Jesus is very concerned that we have an eternal perspective. Six, we're almost there. Jesus gives us a higher standard for loving our persecutors. Yeah, I love this one, boy. I was just couldn't wait to get here. You know, verse 43. Don't you love the Sermon on the Mount? This is just like joyful, you know. I think I'm going to, you know, print this and put it on my refrigerator, you know. You've heard it's, that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. 
But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those that love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are, uh, what you are doing? What are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father uh, is is perfect. So, again, Jesus states their teaching uh, of the law, which says to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Is that what the Old Testament said? Yeah. <laughs> I like those verses. <laughs> Psalm 139, verse 21. Uh, Do I not hate those that hate you, O Lord, and abhor those who rise up against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Right on, David. <laughs> that's, you know, that's where these guys get it. They didn't pull this stuff out of an air. I mean, they, they really taught you love uh, y your brothers, other Jews. You hate those that are not your <laughs> brothers, that are not your friends, that are not on your side. And that's good with God. That's what they taught. That's what the Pharisees taught. And Jesus says that's a distorted view. Uh, that's, that's not the heart of God. And uh, he says we're to love our enemies and pray for those that persecute us. And then he, he gives us three reasons. And I, and I think these are very interesting. He's, the first one is, he says, because you're sons of God. Uh, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. Now, d d does God love those that love him and hate everybody else? No. Well, you're his kids. You're supposed to reflect him. So we're, we're <laughs> right? So this is, is this, this is logical at least, you know? And this, uh, we'd say, obviously, this is sure what we'd want to have in our hearts, at least. Two, We're to do this because of common grace. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, that term, but it just basically, everybody gets God's grace to this extent in terms of what we have in common. Everybody gets to breathe because of God's grace. <laughs> Otherwise, you're just, you don't breathe. He provides it. Uh, everybody gets to, to, if you wake, woke up this morning, Christian or non-Christian, Hindu or New Ager, it was because of God's grace. If you went out and enjoyed a beautiful sunrise or a sunset or noticed the stars, had any joy in your life at all, it was the grace of God. It doesn't matter if you know him, ever said his name, ever bowed your knee, nothing. All mankind, it rains on the righteous and the unrighteous, the good and the evil, God's common grace. If God gives his grace to everyone in that degree, then so should we, Jesus says. Again, it, it, it makes sense, doesn't it? It's just, it's just the doing it part, but we're, all, we're on track with what we ought to be doing here. Three, we are to do this because of a reward in heaven. Uh, again, it, uh, that's what he says. If you, verse 46, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Well, the implication is if you go beyond that, you get a reward in heaven. So Jesus gives us reasons why we should be doing this. And then he says, man, if, you, if you're only uh, friendly with uh, and you only love those that love you, uh, the tax collectors do that. And we all know tax collectors are the scum of the earth, right? Amen? No, no I'm just tax season is coming up. It's supposed to be a little bit of a joke there. But they, they certainly were in Jesus' day because they were sold out to the Romans and so forth. Uh, forgive me if you work for the IRS. That was just a little joke. And... Um, <laughs> We just love you guys <laughs> because Jesus commanded us because <laughs> you're the persecutors. No, the, uh, uh, it's tough. This is tough stuff. Jesus is saying that, you know, uh, everybody does that. I I'm calling you to so something so far greater than, than that. And, uh, and here's, I just want to end with one story and hopefully this will be the encouraging part. Well, two things. Do you think this is encouraging that Jesus is saying, this is how I want you to be? Uh, in a way, it's like, you remember, uh, Jesus goes in the synagogue right there in Capernaum. I mean, close to where, physically where they're at right now. Uh, and he goes in there, not far from Peter's house. Uh, he goes in that, the synagogue, and his enemies are there. And they're waiting to see if he's going to heal on the Shabbat, on the Sabbath. Because there's a guy in there with a withered hand. They know that Jesus will walk in a room in a synagogue. It's not that, uh, it's, it's kind of cool. It's about the size of this room right here. 
that synagogue we're talking about, I've stood on the foundation. It's about the size of this room. I don't know. Sometimes we have images, you know, uh, this is a little village, fishing village. It's not a big, big place or anything. They're not in Jerusalem. And a, a room this size, Jesus walks in, and they know that he's going to go to the guy with the greatest need right away. And he does. I mean, even the enemies knew that. They knew that Jesus was loving compassion. They knew all this stuff about him. And he does. He goes to the guy with the withered hand, and he tells him to... Uh, stretch out his hand. And the guy says, what are you crazy? I can't do that. No, he doesn't do that. What does the guy do? He stretches out his hand. What's the point? Jesus never asked us to do anything that he doesn't then enable us with the ability to do it. So he sets the standard. Be perfectly mature. It doesn't mean sinless, but it does mean mature, a fullness of life as a believer. And here's the standard dealing with everything from purity of relationships to, uh, you know, the way we look at that people that uh, don't like us and persecute us and mean evil against us. And he says, there's another way around all of this other than you know, just trying to defend yourself and go through life that way. If you want to hang on to your possession so tightly and you'll keep your eyes on me and you'll submit to, uh, to, to my love and let me pour my love into your life, I can transform you. Please understand, Jesus is not saying, okay, now take the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, rule number one. Okay, rule number two. Uh, rule number three, never do this. Uh, rule number four, always do this so we can live out the Sermon on That's not the point. That's just being a Pharisee again. The point is, is like this thing is so far beyond us, we'll go, <laughs> I quit. I can't do this, Lord. And he goes, good. Okay, now we're in business. <laughs> now we're in business. Uh, and uh, as Bob Holm was mentioned, so that means every time something good comes out of you, you're going to go, praise the Lord, that was, that was good because I can't do this. <laughs> That's really the bottom line, isn't it? And uh, if we do that, then... The, you know, the Lord will just by his spirit and the sense of kind of stoke the fire. And, and there's stuff obviously we can do. I mean, in terms of uh, our time with the Lord, our worship of the Lord, being in the word and those things, uh, and just his spirit enabling us. And then when we do some of this stuff, people go, what is up with you? Uh, just I'm following the Lord and he's good and provided this. And can I help you with this? Can I help you again with this? And people go, where do you go to church on Sunday? I've met Christians before. They don't do stuff like this. They're as selfish as anybody else. Uh, no, it's not, it's not church. It's just the Lord, you know. It's what God's doing. You should have seen me before. I'd have killed you. <laughs> and, uh, and God does, does it work. So look at this and go, praise the Lord, God, what, what you're going to do in me. Because he says... He is faithful to complete the work that he's begun. Wow, this is going to be great, Lord. I mean, I'm kind of there. I'm struggling some issues. You know, this is a great prayer list, too, to even go through it and go, anger. Oh, boy, I still struggle there, Lord. Lord, I pray that you'd forgive me because I said this yesterday. and I want to repent from that because I don't want to keep going down that road because I know you're concerned about my heart. Lord, here's this. Oh, yeah, there's that other issue, Lord. I, I, Lord, I just lift. You can just go through it. Repent. Say, God, I need your help in this area. He, he's like, no way, you're not worthy. That ain't going to happen. I'm going to let you struggle here, man. No, he doesn't do that. The Lord is there waiting for us to, to cry out for help. Right? Is, it, is, this, is this the Bible here? Is this, is this the Jesus that we know that died for us? I think it is. Tough stuff, though, isn't it? Tough stuff. So let's pray that in time we could love the Sermon on the Mount. In the meantime, we'll just love the Lord and pray for him to do a work. How's that? Now I praise you, Lord of all creation. You ordained the sun to rise and fall. You scatter the stars across the heavens. You come close enough to hear me call. i 
Cry. 